Good morning. I know that our climate reality leaders are online and I thank you for joining us on Stories for a Better Normal. I would like to welcome our partner in this weekly Stories for a Better Normal that came about because of the COVID-19 pandemic and the bill that hopefully will be enacted into law soon, which is the New Norm Act, renamed as a Better Normal Bill. One of our partners for this webinar, whichever you call it, is the Climate Change Commission and the Climate Reality Project Philippines. And the head of the Climate Reality Project, aside from Red Constantino of the Institute of Climate and Sustainable Cities, which is also our partner institution, but the head of the Climate Reality Philippines is Nashreen Castro, one of our young dynamic um, youth activists on climate action. So I would like to request Najreen, who I was texting with last night uh, about this show and about all the initiatives that the youth uh, should take and are taking and all the laws that I have done in my more than 20 years in the legislature and government. I would like Nashreen to introduce all the youth activists and I would like to hear the voice of the youth on climate action, not just on speeches and webinars, but actual grassroots project and your knowledge of laws that we have enacted and how perhaps have you translated it into urgent climate action in your respective local communities. Hi, Nashreen, good morning. Hi, good morning, Deputy Speaker. Maganda umaga po. Maganda umaga. Yeah. I'm glad that you have a plant um, by your side. Okay. Yeah. So, Nashreen, <laughs> usually I do most of the talking, but um, it was an early morning, and um, just so that everybody knows, I was supposed to be in the Development Academy of the Philippines where I had another, uh, well, lecture or speech, um, but then it was overlapping with this. Uh, not that I don't give the depth importance, but I had to ask someone to read my message there so that I could be with you now. So I, uh, I apologize for this um, slight delay. I wanted to come on time exactly at 10 a.m. So Nashreen, first, uh, you and I know much about climate reality. And my dear friend, former Vice President Al Gore had initiated that long ago and has done global trainings including the Philippines in 2016. But let's talk about the young climate reality leaders who have since graduated from the training and the workshop. Uh, introduce them, tell us about your program, tell us about not how it started because we know that already, but yeah. what else is in store for the Philippines and the youth of the Philippines from climate reality. How to translate all my loss of 20 years into climate action Definitely. that will benefit <laughs> the community. Okay, Nashreen. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, again, thank you, um, Deputy Speaker Legarda, for sharing this platform to our young climate reality leaders. And I know this episode is very fitting um, to drum beat our activities for the upcoming Youth International Day on August 12th. So first of our speakers is Paula Bernasor. She's a project manager and experienced de designer from Talisay, Cebu. She's involved in several causes on sustainability, education, and community empowerment. She competed in beauty pageants, and she also loves exploring offbeat destinations, just like you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Hello, Paula. Hello. Hello. Hi. Maayong buntag, uh, Paula. Uh, I hope that you are safe and well. Just like Metro Manila, I know that Cebu still has a, a high case of uh, COVID-19. So please be safe, stay at home. Uh, and uh, But we'll talk about not COVID-19, but maybe in a way uh, how the climate youth uh, leaders can help in this pandemic and uh, what are the climate action you can do. Sige. Okay, Nashreen, how about our other guests? We will ask Paula okay. to share with us the Cebu group later on. Okay. Our second speaker is Johnny Altomonte. He is a young chief executive officer and founder of Burn Energy Solutions, a startup focused on sustainable energy in the Philippines. 
He's also a scuba diver and a voracious reader. Hello, Johnny. Hey, everyone. And uh, it's nice to meet you, Deputy Speaker. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you from? Uh, where are you now? In Metro Manila or in yes. the province? Yes, I'm in Metro Manila. So Okay, just... let's all be safe. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Can we identify the plants behind us? Uh, what is <laughs> the course. plant behind you? So that is a philodendron gloriosum. Uh, philodendron. Yeah. So I, actually, I think everything here is a philodendron or most things. That's a philodendron pink princess, which isn't really pink right now. That's it's a very nice to have that. Yeah. Up there. Yeah. So these are all things I'm hoping will be growing much bigger and more lush very over good. the next couple of months. Do you see my plant at the back? That is San Severia. Yes. And yeah. San Severia is so easy. It's just indoor. And do um, you know that the San Severia is an, I call it an oxygen plant. People yeah. call it mother-in-law's tongue because it's sharp. That's not fair to mother-in-laws. But uh, <laughs> I call it the oxygen plant because it emits uh, the oxygen. It, it opens up its eyes and its pores at night. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it does. Um, and it's actually one of my favorite indoor plants because it, it won't die on you. Like there are okay, things that will die, die on you. you. That one will stay alive forever. Like you can. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Nashreen, back to you. <laughs> Yes, deputy speaker. Um, Johnny is also uh, he also has an online um plant shop, which he started during the quarantine. So oh, plant yeah. shop. No, we can talk plants. Oh, kaya pala alam niya yung mga ano ko. That's where you got me. Ako pag-usapang halaman at gulay. Ayan forever. O sige, next. Uh -oh. Okay. Our third speaker is Dr. Renzo Ginto, the chief planetary doctor of PH Lab. He received his Doctor of Public Health degree from Harvard. He is also an Obama Foundation uh, Asia Pacific leader and Aspen Institute New Voices Fellow. Good morning, Dr. Renzo. Good morning, Nazreen, and good morning, uh, Deputy Speaker. I really good feel morning. privileged to be here. What is the PH Lab? Is, is that your company, your startup? Yes, yes. So uh, I'm glad you noticed it. And I don't have plants behind me, but I have my uh, startup's logo. Uh, PH, as we know, stands for the Philippines, but it also stands for public health, planetary health. And if you remember back in chemistry class, that's also how we measure the acidity and alkalinity of solutions. And I think in this day and age, PH7 is what we need, PH balance, balance between economy and ecology, between the health of people and the health of the planet. So I'm Very looking good. to hear more about my work later. Tell us more about PH lab and the balance. That's very important. Balance between business and the environment, Indeed. sustainable development. Uh, you're sounding like a young Lauren Legarda in 1998 when I was senator. Okay. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Rosel Morales, the committee chairperson for the environment of the 12th National Youth Parliament of the National Youth Commission. She is, an act, uh, she is active in environment conservation, protection, and resuscitation. She also does yoga and practices meditation. Hello, Rosa. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, you're with the NYC. Yes, po. Um, uh, National Youth Parliament is under the supervision of the National Youth Commission, but uh, we're a separate entity. The 12th NYP is a separate entity. It's uh, created by the National Youth Commission uh, but not uh, appointed under the National Youth Commission. Is that yes. correct? Yes, Pa. Yes. And, and very good that you're wearing an indigenous uh, embroidery weave. Is that from Abra? Uh, no, Pa. Uh, I got this. I want to thank Nadesda, uh, my childhood oh, the friend. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, okay lang po ito. Uh -oh. I don't know with whatever. Uh, it, looks, uni uh, it, nig. it looks like it's it nig from an IP group in Abra. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I should search them for, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, Najreen. Okay, up next is Jessica Wu, a co-founder of Less Takes. She is also a coordinator of Let's Do It Philippines for the National Cleanup Day Coalition and a co-organizer of the Zero Waste Academy. Hello, Jess. Wait, zero Hello. waste, very good. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, it's great to be here. Very good. So I, uh, I, I, I'm glad that you're uh, doing the, are you heading the Zero Waste Academy? Is it 
of the uh, local government academy of the DILG or is this an NGO? Um, yes, uh, yes, Paul, the latter. It's, um, it's actually under the supervision of the mother NGO, which is the Let's Do It Philippines. Um, our co-convener or, or our convener is Dan Diaz, um, who's also heading the National Cleanup Day. Um, so I, I coordinate with the three um, three yeah. NGOs. Uh -huh. And um, obviously, uh, you would know by heart Republic Act 9003, the segregation <laughs> of waste at source, recycling, and composting, right? Yes, well, I, I guess that's where we're going to head at. Um, we're trying to do the annual cleanup day and then campaign for um, zero waste um, lifestyle. For all the for all the communities, but because of the pandemic, we have a lot of restrictions. Uh, you can actually do a virtual uh, teaching yes, of my yes. almost uh, twenty year old law, mm -hmm. um, so that each climate reality in his or her home, in his or her barangay, can mm -hmm. ensure a zero waste barangay. That's the very least. Yes. If you were elected appointed or graduated as a climate reality leader, the least you can do to be deserving of a climate reality leader name or position is to make sure the home, the room, the place where you live and wake up is zero waste. If you do not segregate waste at source, recycle and compost, mm, I'm sorry, yeah. something missing and you're being a climate reality. So I wish I could inspect where you are <laughs> seated now, all of you that I've been talking, uh, and Nasreen would know that, uh, how I inspect my Senate office and my House of Rep office, and how I live it day by day, having five bins, mm. botelata plastic, tissue waste na kahiwalay, food mm -hmm. waste na ginagawang compost, na binabaon sa lupa, ginagawang organic fertilizer, at yung residual o latak, at yung paper waste na kahiwalay na gagamitin baliktaran pagkatapos ay re-resikulo, at yung mga lumang papel ang ginagawang mga ecobag. Ayan. So dapat alam yan ng Zero Waste Academy, dapat mas may alam pa kayo, <laughs> para turuan lahat ng ating climate reality. Pag ako'y nasusian dyan, tuloy-tuloy ito. Okay, Nashreen, back oh. to you. <laughs> Thank you po. Deputy Speaker, um, Jess is also engaged uh, with our local um, IP community in Bukidnon. And yesterday, we were talking about your initiatives on women who weave. So uh, there's a similar um, initiative being done also in in Bukidnon, which later on she would also uh, would like to discuss as well in her presentation. So our next speaker is Carl Alonsagay, uh, the project liaison officer of the Climate Jukate project. Uh, he is an Antiqueño from Pandan. He is an academic fellow for the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative and currently doing his graduate studies at the University of the Philippines Open University. Hi, Carl. Hello, class. Good morning. Hi. And good morning. You're speaking. from Pandan. Yes, Carlo. Pa. Yes, Pa. Aha. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, have we met? Yes, Pa. Uh, several times. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, because there was a climate reality leader who previously took the course already two years ago. Um, and they were doing mangrove reforestation in Magaba in Pandan. Is that yes, your pa. group? Uh, yes, Pa. We were the ones who lobbied the Magawa Mangroves um, protection. Very good. Okay. Um, later, ha, I'll ask you, ilan ang ating marine protected areas, no matter how small, in our municipality of Pandan? Number two, ano ang ginagawa ninyo para pangalagaan ito? Pangatlo, ano ang hindi deklarado or by local or national legislation pero dapat madeklara para ang Pandan ay maging uh, protected area ang buong LGU. Handa ka, Carlo, ha? And you'll be my partner in Pandan dahil dapat ang buong antike. Pero kung mahirap, Pandan, dahil yan ay nasa gitna o puso ng ating legislated na INIPAS. By now, I'm sure alam naman ninyo, yung expanded national integrated protected area system at ang dalawang protected area sa aking home province ng antike ay 
si Balom Natural Park na kahapon ay biniscuss namin sa aming webinar na Protected Areas Talk at ang Northwest Panay Peninsula of which Panay Antique is a part of. Correct, Carlo? Yes, Pa, ma'am. <laughs> Dapat ikaw nagsasalita, hindi ako eh. <laughs> Nasirin sabi ko kayo magsasalita eh kaya lang ako na lecture na naman eh. Sige. Okay, next. Okay, um our next speaker is um a Pinoy climate reality leader today. Um he was uh, she was trained in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, her name is Hilary Howe, a business development associate of AC Infrastructure Holdings Corporation and she is also part of the Manila Hub of Global Shapers. Hi Hilary. Hi guys, good morning. Good morning, the fit speaker Loren. Nice to be on good the morning. show. Good morning. Where are Thanks you now? Uh, I'm I'm originally from Zamboanga, but right now I'm in Metro Manila, just like okay. most of us here. Yeah. Wow, Zamboanga. You know, there's a protected area there. There's also an industrial economic zone, and I had uh, supported the establishment or the improvement of the Yakan Village. I'm sure you're familiar with yep, the Yakan yep. Village, where they weave and sell um, Yakan textiles. Yes, pa. Nabisita mo na, gumanda na. Dati of course, kasi I've been there. Parang mga yeah. barong-barong kawawa sila, pero ngayon maganda na siya. Nakita mo na? Yes po. yes po, yes po. It's really nice to see that they're, you know, they're uplifting their livelihood and you see them already in the manga. They're selling their weaves, they're selling slippers and very ma many handicrafts. So Were they happy with the project I did to I build them so, yes, that um, nice indigenous uh, weaving center? I think so, yes po. Yeah, okay. Very good. <laughs> Okay, our okay. next speaker is um, connecting from uh, Washington D.C. He is Ethan Spanner, the director Spanner rather, the director of international program of the Climate Reality Project. He oversees the the global branch offices in the Tunisia branch systems overall global strategy. He also leads the organization's international climate change policy and advocacy activities. Good evening, Ethan. Good evening, Nazreen, and nice to see you again, Deputy Speaker Lagarda. Always a pleasure. Hi, Ethan. Yes, what time is it there? 10.25 p.m. Oh, yes, it's just the other way, so that's not too bad. Okay, eh, so, too bad. Um, very good. Ethan, so you've been with us from the beginning, from 25 minutes ago, right? Oh, yeah. I've been with okay. you from the beginning of Climate Reality Philippines. Okay, yeah, correct. I mean, but the beginning of this webinar, but yeah. the beginning of Climate Reality Philippines, number one, uh, please send my warmest uh, greetings uh, to Vice President Al Gore. Second, uh, yes, we're updated and watching all the trainings and workshops that he does. Um, is it live or virtually? And third, uh, I would like to challenge Ethan and Najreen to make sure that all the laws that I legislated, especially ESWM and the ENIPAS protection should be mainstreamed in the climate reality Philippines and in the communities where our climate leaders are. So let's not reinvent the wheel and think of what can we do? What policies can we institute? Simple. Let us operationalize and do young climate IRR, implementing rules and regulations to make sure that the laws work for the youth of our country. Is that not a good idea, Ethan? That is a great idea, and it's in no better hands than Nazreen. Okay, Nazreen. So I will ask you to have a memorandum of commitment, a commitment of our climate reality leaders that they first know the laws, number two, understand its importance. Number three, commit to implement it on the ground. Do I have the commitment of Nashreen and the Climate Reality Philippines? And Red Constantino's also with us. You're forced to good, Red. <laughs> Definitely, uh, Deputy Speaker Legarda. We were discussing yesterday um, if the youth could be given more space to be involved in national and local um, dialogues and policies and even legislative. So um, our youth leaders are really um, excited if we will be given a, an opportunity um, such as this to um, have a voice on legislation as well and other national and local 
profited. So definitely, yes. uh, Deputy Speaker Lagarda. I, I think that's the great um, uh, connection here, Ethan. Um, first, my question is, what is the importance of youth activism in the world and for the platform of Vice President Al Gore and for the Philippines? How important is the Philippines? And second, for Nashreen and for Ethan, is the way for the youth is, if I may help set a direction also, is to know all the laws and to make sure that these laws are being not just supervised and monitored, but actually implemented and has a positive impact on the community. Because when you think about it, we already have the law for solid waste. We have the law for clean air. We have the law for clean water. We have the law for renewable energy. One of your climate leaders is into sustainable energy. We have the law uh, for education, environmental education awareness. We have the law for climate. We even have the law for funding of climate finance, which is the PSF, People's Survival Fund. So I've laid out all the laws for the youth since 1998. My challenge now is, is for you to implement, but to operationalize these laws into action points, uh, climate action in Zamboanga, climate action in Cebu, climate action in NCR, on how it is relevant, applicable in your respective localities. So perhaps we hear from Ethan on the role of youth activism in the world, how important are the youth uh, of the country, of the Philippines, and how we can uh, do all this, Nushreen? Well, I mean, I think that the youth activism around the world is, it's everything. It's wildly important to us. It's um, particularly at this crucial time, not just for the many things that are going on in the world, not least of which is the pandemic, but we just had this huge global training where we found ourselves uh, training quite a bit of youth, but we're in the full understanding that tomorrow's leaders need to have the space today to really hone their skills, have their voice heard. Um, in doing so, what we've actually found is that these aren't the leaders of tomorrow. These are already the leaders of today. We could learn a lot by listening to young people in our countries, not least of which the Philippines. I am neither a youth nor a Filipino, um, but the youth are passionate. They're fighting for their lives. They give me hope. And so our challenge as an organization, I think, and as a, as a, as a generation really, is sort of twofold. First, how do we bring people into our community, bring young people into our community so that we can learn from them and if necessary, provide the training and the resources that are needed to fill those gaps. Uh, and second, what, what kind of training and resources are necessary? You know, what can we accomplish with what we have? And when do we go, and I think this speaks to what you were saying here, Deputy Speaker, is when do we go from education and awareness to action, to action and implementation. Where is that crucial point and how can our generation assist that? Um, Nazreen, I don't know if you have something to say first or I can go into what we have up here, which is some of the information about what are climate reality leaders, who they are. First of all, what is a climate reality leader? For those of you watching, uh, a climate reality leader is, is someone who has gone through a climate reality leadership core training somewhere in the world. So Deputy Speaker Lagarda is a climate reality leader. Everyone on this call is a climate reality leader. Uh, other members of the Climate Change Commission, Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, and I would say most Pinoy climate reality leaders were trained in, in 2016 in Manila. But if you look at this right now, this is before our last global training. We just had a global training that's finishing up actually still this week. So you can still finish your requirements. Um, the Philippines will have about 600 new climate reality leaders, which doubles the amount of climate reality leaders in that country uh, in no small part, thanks to this webinar series or this conversation series. Uh, but in the past, we've really skewed older. I think that's because our climate reality leaders have been in the global north. Um, you can see only 9%. We kind of classify youth as 25 and below. Although in my mind, I'm 35. Anything 30 and below is like a child. 
uh, but only 9% of climate reality leaders are 25 years and below, and only 5% in the Philippines, which when I found that out was, was startling. It doesn't match the demographics of the nation. You look at it, okay, when we had the training in 2016, it was more people were, were younger when they were actually trained, but we need more youth. We need that buy-in for the future. We need our climate reality leaders to reflect the countries that they're in and, uh, and just better engagement for activism purposes. Uh, as people get older, sometimes they tend to be less uh, involved in, in activism, which I disagree with, but it, it does happen. Um, so if we go to our next slide, we can sort of talk about where we're going now because- I just wanted to ask, um, uh, I just wanted to ask Ethan, it says here that uh, Najreen, can you validate that? That um, a very small portion of our climate reality leaders Philippines are 25 years old and younger. What then is the average age of our climate reality leaders in the Philippines? Is it 30, 35, 40? Uh, Najreen? Now the um, late 30s, late 30s. So it's uh, above 35. So uh that's the average yes and uh the challenge ethan as you're saying is that we should recruit uh more climate reality leaders uh 25 years old and younger correct absolutely. is that what you're saying absolutely yeah okay so what we need to do is to link up with the state universities and colleges and um including the provinces and the university of the philippines uh so that uh, so I can link you. Um, we can actually do a webinar with not just climate reality leaders already trained, but also those would be uh, trainees uh, from selected state universities, all the 100 plus of them, as well as the University of the Philippines system all over the country. And perhaps we could get an endorsement from President Danny Concepcion. What do you think of that idea? Because if you have college students who are 17 years old up to 21, then that, that would be good. A special training, but perhaps, because perhaps the, the thinking of a 17 to 20 is entirely different from somebody 35 to 40. So it would be a dedicated training for 17, say 18 to 21 for college students, correct? We, we can develop yes. a course program that way or a special training program uh, is read on the line, uh, online. We could do that, Ethan, if that's fine with you, I could help you with that and make sure it is dedicated for students uh, in this virtual world now and with this hybrid learning system, a uh, climate reality uh, program online training uh, would be good for the state universities and colleges. And these are um, scholars, uh, youth scholars who are benefiting from the law which we enacted and funded, which is the Free Education, Free Tertiary Education Act. So it would be good uh, to use, uh, not to use a platform of SUCs and partnership with the Commission on Higher Education including the UP system, my alma mater. Yes, Deputy Speaker. Um, thank you for that offer. And just to compliment, aside from um, consolidating all the students in state universities and colleges, it would also help if these universities extend the um, online or distance learning platform that they're using because uh, mostly the attrition rate of um, of our global trainees in this recently concluded uh, global training July 2020 was because of internet connection. So if we are going to um, pursue with a virtual training, uh, these universities have their um, systems in place and could also help the trainees or their students um, participate in these kind of virtual trainings. Yes, so it's the CHED, Commission on Higher Education, uh, and under it, of course, are the SUCs, including UP, and we can have a DICT to make sure connectivity is not an issue. And, and the agenda and the curriculum for this training uh, should really be geared uh, for the thinking 
and the way of moving, the way, the trend of thought, how the 18 to 21 would be thinking. Is there anyone who's 18 years old in our group now? Who's the youngest? Raise your hand. Who's the youngest, Nashreen? I think, I think it's, I am. Um, okay, if nobody would <laughs> want to yes, say that he or she's the youngest, I'll claim to be the youngest in, in heart, okay? I'm the right? second youngest. <laughs> okay, it's who's the youngest? Carl. It's is there hard. anyone in his um, in his teens? In his teens? No. Okay. No one in the twenties. Okay. How old is Hillary? I'm twenty six. Twenty six. Okay. My question is: For a twenty six year old, what is the greatest environmental concern, and what are you doing about it? What is it that you can do at your age with your limited resources and limited time and, and uh, way of going around during this pandemic? Ano ang pinaka mahalagang issue ng kalikasan na kaya mong solusyonan ngayon bilang isang 26 years old, Hillary? Well, if I if I may, um, Deputy Speaker Lauren, I have two things. So the first is really um, proper waste management segregation at home. It's so easy to do and so convenient to just like, separate. I'm so glad you them. mentioned that. Okay, yeah, very good. That's, that's one. It. Then um, number two, and this one is a, a cause that I hold uh, dear to my heart, is um, nutrition. All of us should eat better, eat well, follow the healthy eating plate that we can see um, as a resource on Harvard. And even locally, we call it Pinggang Pinoy. Um, to Very edit. good. Yeah. Ay, nako. Yan. She hit the nail. Dalawa. Number one, yung aking paboritong batas na ako ang nag-author noong 1998, RA9003. Tama yung sinabi ni Hillary. Hindi kailangan ng pera. Kailangan lang ng utak at puso at disiplina. Hindi ba, Hillary? So si Hillary na ang magtuturo sa lahat ng mga... Um, climate reality leaders, including our Zero Waste Academy, including Sonia Mendoza, who may not be a teenager, but who's with the Mother Earth Foundation, who's with us now, who will help teach. It's so easy to segregate waste at source, recycle, and compost. It's so easy to use our bote, lata, plastic, uh, and plant uh, an herb, or even a kangkong, or an alugbati, or a talbos ng kamote and to make your own compost. It's so clean and practical and sanitary. And second, mag -e evolve yan sa good nutrition. Pag nagluto ka ng, nag, nag, uh, tanim ka ng uh, organic na alugbati, yun na ang iyong kakainin sa salad o yung talbos ng kamote na pinapakuluan lang. Tama, Hilary? Tama po. <laughs> oh, sige. Ang dal -dal ko. Okay, Ethan, uh, back to you. Um, the reason why I interrupted because I was concerned about the lack of involvement of the 18 to 25. So the solution is there with you, Nashreen. It's up to you and Red, um, the, your organization, uh, to get it going. But uh, the Climate Change Commission and my office will help you in that. And if I may, Deputy Speaker, it could go yeah. a step farther even with that. And if you're looking at 23, 24, 25, 26 years old, you're getting your footing and you're in a company you may be working at and you have this awesome resource of Al Gore's presentation. That is education from the youth that needs to be given to older generations to just understand the opportunities that arise from renewable energy, from uh, weatherizing your businesses from just general ESG practices. They can use examples like your own son, for example, who's done incredible work with his solar company. So the opportunities are there, definitely, just outside of school even. I'm glad you mentioned, you know, I don't want it to come from me, but he's a 27-year-old entrepreneur who started when he was 19. And perhaps not under my watch, but you, you can get him as your own speaker, but virtually, because he's locked down in Metro Manila as well. But it's amazing how the young man has uh, built by himself um, his own company, hundreds and hundreds of, um, of um, uh, megawatts of uh, renewable energy solar plants all over the country. 
exactly. And the good news is, is we are getting younger. So we saw in this global training that was all online, much younger ages. So the, the, the average was 37, still higher than, you know, than, than you would consider youth. Why is there but a lack of interest? Out, is there a lack of interest? So I think it comes down to a few things. When it goes, when we're talking about in-person trainings, I think it definitely has to do with the ability to travel, the ability to take time off of school. I think we, uh, a lot of retirees go to our trainings as lifelong learners, which we definitely encourage. Um, but I think that more people were able to join the virtual training and you see the mode, the most common age of someone who joined our virtual training was 26 years old. And if you take out the outliers, think, okay, well, you have to be at least 13 with parental permission. So really you have to be 18 to join. We had a few folks who were in their nineties who joined. You take out some of those outliers, then you're looking at 33 years old. It's very much skewing a lot younger. And people, uh, the younger generations are just tech savvy. They understand how to, how to interface with each other online. Uh, they have more energy to do it. They, I think, just have more to lose. And as each year goes on, they recognize that uh, if they don't do something, if they don't get the information they need and get the resources to share that information, that a lot more is on the line than has ever been on the line for generations prior to them. It's great to see the linkage between those generations. So when Vice President Gore has, has met Greta Thunberg a few times um, and, and you know, when, when that happens, he just takes a back seat and just learns from people like that. Uh, so we do take a, a, every branch has some sort of, of youth engagement. In fact, really our, our, until about two years ago, most of our youth engagement with the Climate Reality Project was international, it was in the branches. Uh, I think that makes sense given the age skews younger and those demographics just as the population as a whole um, so they knew that they had more young people to work with. We went ahead and just built it into our global goals. So specifically one of the goals for our branch system is building partnerships and capacity for this generation and the next. So that incorporates education, incorporates youth activism. Um, interestingly, the, there are fewer climate leaders, like I was saying, internationally who are under 25, but I think, like I said, cost of travel, there's just fewer international trainings and not, uh, you know, we'll go 10 years between being in, in the Philippines or South Africa before we have another training. I wouldn't like, I, I don't love that. I try to get back as often as we can. Um, but the branches are learning from the youth in terms of organizing. So we're really moving, I think, from some of these, which you see here, which are mainly education programs and moving into that action. Uh, they especially are starting to use online tools a lot better. Um, and the branches teach them sort of basic things about climate science, about um, how to put together an organization, just basic things you might need in your toolbox of skills while there's this knowledge exchange going back and forth. Um, but yeah, that's the reason why our global training was so important is it just drew in a much younger demographic. Um, One thank thing you very much, Ethan. Please stay yeah. on, but um, we'd like to give our youth who are with us uh, online now the opportunity to tell us about the climate action they've done in their communities. Uh, let's start with Cebu, where the pandemic uh, is really taking its toll on the people and how uh, Paula, who's from Cebu, is using the digital platform for her environmental awareness campaign for an urgent climate action. What kind of of climate action have you done since 2016? And how has it impacted on the youth and in your community? Paula from Cebu. Yes, um, good morning, everyone. Um, would Ms. Nasreen have um, to speak first? I, I think. No, or, um, um, go I, ahead, Paula. <laughs> yeah, so um, since I think I would need the slides. Um, Paula Bernasor is a project manager and experienced designer. Uh, she took the course in 2016. So she'll tell us about how in the digital platform she has uh, helped 
in the advocacy campaign and raising um, awareness and the projects that she's done in the past few years. Okay. We hear yeah, from, I would, from Cebu. Yeah. I would like to share more about um, what I think is a new, new rebellion that's starting more now after uh, because of the pandemic and it's called the Green Rebellion. Well, everyone thinks um, green is just for environment, but I think now we have to get creative with our the, the kind of rebellion that we do. So I'm sharing more like how the past was, what the present is and what will be the future. So before my kind of rebellion was first walking, walking the talk. So I aimed for going everything fully reusable and buying and promoting local. So it's been more than seven years since I really stopped advocating for fast fashion. I have not bought a new clothes for a year, more than a year. So that, that move alone is already like a big stand against the whole fashion industry who, are, who is contributing to a lot of the, the pollution and also um, issues um, with different environmental and ethical issues. And my other rebellion was doing education drive. So in this photo, you can see us with several books. Now this was just done online. All the books were collected through Facebook and we just um, gathered friends. It was a grassroots movement of bringing books to remote areas in the Philippines because I, because we thought that most of the people who are affected don't even know that they are affected. So the first thing that we could help in the past was bringing books to remote areas. And, and the last one is IRL, or it's like a youth term for in real life campaign. So before we used to do weekly um, cleanup dives here in Cebu. So I, I was one of the cleanup divers and we were working with local free, dry, free divers and a lot of them are volunteers from Staff Philippines, which is also a youth organization here. And mostly since I'm also passionate about sharing how I am fighting the rebellion, doing talks on conservation, mostly on marine conservation since Cebu is quite known for their beaches. So moving to the present, during, since the whole pandemic has happened, the new normal and digital platforms have gained more power. So I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people heard about the barter community here in Cebu. So we have got, gotten more reliant, reliant on digital platforms. So even now, it's easier to convince the youth, everyone who's affected in the pandemic, that we should care about our climate and our environment because now everyone's getting affected in terms of inequality in food security and everyone's experiencing the effects of climate change and yet so now we have we have more people using facebook to do local movements such as like the barters getting connected with local farmers and i think that's that's a good uh, move where we are now and I see all the trend in social media now is being a plant people or a plant pita sharing what their plants are how they are reusing and I've been also posting about how I regrow my seeds that I use for cooking and how I, I just try to have zero waste on everything so for the future I see the future of activism as more of sharing. So now that there's, I actually had a friend who wanted to start up the barter community way back before the pandemic, but it was hard for him to get people to realize how important sharing your waste or like resources that you already have to the people. But since the pandemic, everyone has been on the barter. And I think People have heard about how ridiculous the barter here in, the, in, in Cebu, definitely, where there was someone like even trying to barter their resort or something like that. But everyone now looks at this barter community for changing things that they already have that they don't need for something that they can uh, use. And another one is decentralization. So given now that we are locked down and experiencing quarantines, so there has been a more push to do everything locally. 
So now more people are connected through the local communities. They know who their local providers are for food, for everything that they need. And lastly is, I see the future of mixing tradition and tech. So um, one of the good movements that's relating to the pandemic is a friend of mine started selling like masks that helps the Itneg and the Yakan community. So they are traditional, they, are, they do traditional weaves, but it has been used and being improved. So that's another way that we can re revolutionize what is traditional and mixing it with techno technology. So that, that's it. And just to remind everyone that climate activism does not need a big budget. It just needs you. It's just quarantine or no quarantine, you can start something. And one thing that I actually started together with my group for this um, global training is we will be doing an online webinar since we know that the problem is getting the youth engaged. So we are making the Green Rebellion as fashionable. So we will be doing a talk on how to have less food waste and to advocate for social to sustainable fashion this coming August. So that's how we are starting the rebellion now. Very good. Um, you, you've covered um, so many uh, subject matters from no waste, uh, well, zero waste, and um, even your rebellion in not buying anything new. Reminds me of Jane Fonda, but Jane Fonda is in her 80s when she said she's not buying anything new from fashion. But here's someone in her uh, 20s or 30s who is saying that, so that's um, admirable. But then again, we have to support local, so there's some if, ifs or buts about that. But also, you mentioned about zero waste and the use of local textiles, uh, et cetera. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we stay on. Uh, Nashreen, who is our next climate leader from Cebu. Uh, from Cebu, from uh, from Paula, we proceed to? Uh, we proceed to Johnny Altamonte, the CEO of Vern Energy Solution. Okay. To talk about sustainable yeah. energy. Very good. Go sustainable ahead. energy, renewable energy. Uh, are you an advocate? Uh, do you actually do uh, your own power plants uh, in what kind of energy system? Uh, would like to hear from you. Yeah, definitely. Um, can we get the slides up, please? Awesome. Vern. Yes. Okay. So um, I founded a company. We're called Vern Energy Solutions. So um, for those of you who aren't too familiar, it's named after Jules Verne, who is one of the most prominent science fiction writers. Uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Journey to the Center of the Earth, uh, Around the World in 80 Days, right? Um, so a brief background on why we're called Verne. Uh, Jules Verne, um, he dreamed up this circular system powered by energy, which was sourced from, but uh, without exhausting natural resources in the 1800s, when he first gifted us with, uh, with science fiction. And we're now at a time when we can make this happen with renewable energy. So with renewable energy, we can limit fossil fuels. We can limit the usage of coal. We can improve efficiency in every building, every house, every mode of transport. The untapped potential in the Philippines is remarkable. Um, however, we still have a long way to go when it comes to sustainability and fair access. And uh, that's why I personally went to sustainable energy as an industry and why I named my company after Jules Verne. I get to make science fiction a reality. And that's definitely something I can dedicate my, my whole life to. Uh, so aside from managing Vern, I also serve as a policy consultant uh, where my focus really is on the environment and sustainability since I am uh, an environmental scientist actually by training. Um, so how does this shift to being able to work remotely uh, either as a company um, or as a policy consultant? Um, one of the good things now is almost all interaction is online. Well, sometimes it's not such a good thing, right? When people message you at like 11 in, in the evening. Um, but this is a really, really strong leverage point, right? Uh, information is so accessible and it's so easy to spread now. But the opposite is also true. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, the, the Viber groups which share um, random stories and anecdotal evidence from whoever, right? So there's a lot of misinformation. And this would be one of my the easiest, the most lowest, the, the lowest hanging fruit for people, uh, for climate activists, for climate leaders, or for, for anyone, um, really is to fact check your information, uh, share information from trusted sources. 
Uh, this is something that's really easy to do and really accessible. Um, and it's one of the simplest ways to, to be a climate activist from the comforts of your own house. Um, other than that, for me personally, reading and writing is a lot easier at home. And reading and writing is super important, uh, not just for policy, where of course you have to read all the time, you have to write a lot. Uh, but even for, um, even for like a company, right, for a startup, there's so much information, there's so much new information constantly churning out, especially now with COVID-19. Um, for example, in the US, you have all these new, uh, the, the Green New Deal that Joe Biden is now promoting. It, it's a huge package and there's a lot to unpack there and there's a lot to study. So shifting remotely, uh, it's, for me, a lot of it is quite easy to do all that reading and writing at home. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so moving forward, um, what we really aim to do, uh, we're really looking at greening LGUs in particular. So we're currently working with some new projects with LGUs and we might release a new product actually along this line uh, down the road, um, which I'll actually be presenting later at a demo for new energy nexus. But there, renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions solve a lot of existing pain points for LGUs, right? So clean water, access to energy, market access, employment opportunities, which are super important now with COVID-19 driving up unemployment rates, um, women empowerment. Uh, a lot of the tenets of sustainable development are dependent on similarly sustainable energy. Uh, so it's really important, especially at the LGU level, um, at the community level, even at the barangay level, to start greening from an energy perspective, because energy really is the foundation from which we move forward. Uh, we can't have a sustainable community without sustainable energy. Uh, also moving forward, uh, policy is arguably one of the most impactful arenas for climate activism. <laughs> Deputy Speaker Lorna Gardeau uh, is one of the staunchest advocates for this in the Philippines and has, uh, and has authored so many of our laws. Um, so currently what I'm helping to do now is I'm currently working with some of the Senate offices to draft some more, uh, either to take uh, that environmental aspect when looking at uh, legislature, at upcoming policy, especially with the upcoming, um, uh, with all the new laws that are coming out to uh, reinvigor the economy because of COVID-19. So it's important that, especially now we're in the middle of a, of a paradigm shift. And it's important that as we, move towards a new normal as we draft these new laws and we look towards the future that we really include and incorporate sustainability within everything we do moving forward especially policy um and yeah that's it that's me thanks johnny uh i think uh deputy speaker uh doesn't have a question yet so we now go to um re from renewable energy let's go to um the most pressing topic uh right now which is health so our next speaker is dr renzo a planetary health doctor and we want to get your perspective as we try to survive this pandemic while we we are also in a state of climate emergency so we want to hear your thoughts dr renzo Thank you again very much, uh, Nazrin. And again, thanks to the deputy speaker for this uh, personal uh, privilege. Uh, so for the next few minutes, I am going to uh, talk about why climate change is first and foremost a public health issue. And as a medical doctor, um, I was so, um, you know, I, I got so concerned, you know, the first time I heard about climate change more than a decade ago as a young medical student in the UP College of Medicine, I was so alarmed when I heard actually the inconvenient truth for the first time and uh, of, of Vice President Al Gore. And I started to really understand that, okay, this is the biggest public health issue that we'll be confronting, you know, in the next years and decades. And so, some of us in the health professions uh, will need to, to step up and take a look into this issue. And so for the past 10 years, that is what I've been working on, trying to bring climate change into the education of medical and other health professionals, nursing students, uh, trying to help uh, green the health sector, renewable energy in hospitals, trying to change the way we procure our medicines or um, you know, improve uh, ventilation in health facilities. And of course, eventually, uh, and more, most importantly, how do we ensure that we decarbonize our whole economy so that 
uh, we don't just protect ourselves from climate, but we also reap the benefits of, let's say, renewable energy or transitioning from a meat-based to a more plant-based diet. So here are some of my pictures. That's my selfie with Vice President Gore. Um, I was privileged to be part of a climate and health uh, conference that he convened um, in 2017 in Atlanta, Georgia. And next slide, please. And really, early on in my career, I already realized, as I've said, that my patients are not just people. It's not just human patients. It's also the planet, which is basically providing us nourishment and ensures our health and well-being. And both people and planet are currently sick. As we talk about COVID, we know that in the backdrop, there is a climate crisis that is continuously happening, you know? And next slide. Here you will see in this diagram how climate change is linked to human health. So climate change is not just really about, you know, ice caps melting and polar bears getting dehydrated, but fundamentally it's really about people getting sick because of all these climate related and climate sensitive diseases. So you will see that one, the key message from this diagram is there are so many different pathways that link climate change to health, whether it's typhoon or extreme uh, heat or flooding or drought. And then the other message here, as you can see, is there's no single disease group that is immune to climate change, whether it's undernutrition, or cardiovascular disease because of, again, exposure to extreme heat or air pollution and, you know, mental health also. There's a growing evidence that uh, because of climate change, there is an increasing prevalence of what we call eco-anxiety. And of course, um, you know, there are new challenges. For example, uh, in Bangladesh, there's already growing evidence that with the increase in sea level rise, people in coastal communities are getting more hypertension and uh, kidney stones as a result of intake of, high, of water high in salt, again, due to sea level rise. So I'm very concerned if that is already happening in the Philippines, and that's what I want to investigate in the months and years to come. Next slide, please. But of course, and I will be remiss not to talk about perhaps the the biggest public health problem that we have now, uh, you know, in 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 this, uh, you know, uh, at our doorstep, and what we know is that in an increasingly warming planet, the risk of infectious diseases such as COVID nineteen just becomes so high, and there are old emerging, uh, there are old infectious diseases that we expect to reemerge, but there are also new infectious diseases that we can anticipate. To emerge. And so it's not really a surprise that COVID-19 has happened given the warming climate, but also globalization, our encroachment into forest ecosystems, and uh, the way we interact, for example, with animals. And so the more we interact with animals, the higher the likelihood of viruses like COVID-19 jumping from animals to humans. And that is how, you know, this global pandemic that has already affected 16 million people as we speak has, has evolved. Next slide, please. And this is also the sad reality. You know, if COVID-19, you know, when COVID-19 showed up uh, at our doorstep, it didn't mean that climate change stopped. In fact, it's continuing to happen. And now we're seeing, you know, the typhoon season already beginning here in the Philippines. And there's, you know, heat waves are also starting to affect places like Europe, temperate regions of the world. And by the time we reach January, and by the time COVID-19 is likely not have been uh, totally eliminated yet, um, the bushfires in Australia uh, will again be coming back. Next, please. And so the question that I have in mind and that really uh, animates my work as a public health physician is, are we ready to build health systems that consider both climate change, but also, uh, you know, COVID-19. Uh, how to make sure that our health systems bend but do not break, that they are the last system standing when catastrophes like COVID or climate change uh, does occur and inflict uh, harm and suffering to people's lives. Next, please. And, you know, 
a while ago, it was mentioned that I just finished my doctorate at Harvard. My dissertation was really focusing on trying to answer this question. You know, what is the health system of the future? And I think that the health system of the future should be first universal. And we know in the Philippines, we have this unfinished business around achieving universal health coverage. And I'm really concerned that because of COVID, you know, we hear news that, you know, PhilHealth is planning to delay the implementation of universal health care, when in fact, we need universal health care to make sure we are ready for the impacts of whether climate change or COVID. But we also need to make sure that uh, health systems provide high value, high quality. People are happy when they receive the care that they, that they get you know, uh, from, from health facilities, from health workers. But there are also two additional characteristics of 21st century health systems. They need to be climate smart. And you know, we in the climate field know the definition of climate smart. It's a convergence of low carbon mitigation because we don't want health systems to be accomplice to the crime of climate change. We can't, be, we can't keep on treating diseases that come from climate change because of our own emissions. That's anathema to the Hippocratic Oath, uh, you know, the oath that we, we recite uh, at the start of our medical practice, which says to do no harm. And this time we're applying doing no harm, not just to our patients, but also to the planet. And then the other aspect of climate smart is adaptation. How to make sure health systems, you know, are resilient and responsive to the long-term effects of climate change, like the ones that I mentioned a while ago. And of course, in this day and age of COVID, we need to add a fourth feature, which is pandemic resistant health systems. How can we make sure that we can detect the next COVID-19 when it happens? And unfortunately, we live in a tropical country where you know, viruses circulate in the forest. It's just a matter of time when the next COVID-19 erupts from the Philippine jungle. So we need to make sure health systems are ready for that possibility. Next slide, please. And so I'm back in the Philippines and you've heard that I'm building PH Lab now, which is a startup that will help realize this vision of 21st century planetary health systems. And if in the United States, there's a Silicon Valley uh, you know, which is the epicenter for uh, technological innovation. My vision is for the Philippines to be the Silicon Islands of planetary health. And I hope that we can work together with the deputy speaker and with my fellow climate reality leaders to make sure that we become a role model for the world for protecting the health of both people and planet. So next slide, my final, I think it's my final slide. I think this is the most popular graph now in social media, flattening the curve. Unfortunately, we're far from flattening the curve. We can discuss about the COVID-19 situation later and how it intersects with climate change. And my final slide is next, please. There is also another curve that we need to flatten. And this is the curve of our carbon emissions and of our ecological footprint. And if you notice a while ago, there's a horizontal line which refers to healthcare systems capacity. That you can change, that you can enhance, you can add more ICU beds, you can re recruit more health workers. But for this particular graph, the Earth's capacity, we know it's non unchangeable and it's non-negotiable. So there's no other way for this to be addressed except for us really flattening our carbon emissions and ecological footprint. So thank you again and looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Dr. Renzo. I always say this to you after listening to your uh, presentations, webinars. Um, I'm always inspired after listening to you. So um, Deputy Speaker Ligarda is experiencing some technical uh, problems with her Zoom, but she can uh, hear us via audio. So um, I just have a follow-up question. I've, um, I've heard this in your uh, previous uh, webinar that there's increasing waste because of um, because of the necessity of PPEs, masks for medical health workers. So my question is, how can the health industry make COVID recovery green considering the increase of plas plastic waste due to medical necessity? And we know that this will continue uh, over the years. Thanks, Nazreen. And actually, we've started investigating this problem of, this new problem of, you know, PPE pollution, right? And, 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 um, 
the thing with the Philippines is we're still having a shortage actually of PPE. And, and that is the reason why there is a disproportionately high uh, risk of infection for our health workers. So, you know, we need to increase our use of, of PPEs to protect our health workers. But I think this is the time also for us to think of innovative ways to, you know, minimize our use. For example, if we become more efficient in the delivery of care, if we try to look for better materials that, you know, I don't know if there's a biodegradable PPE, that I think will be the best uh, solution. But also I think we need to, you know, there seems to be an unavoidable, um, you know, use of, of PPE because again of the healthcare need, but we need to make sure we reduce dramatically what is preventable and avoidable. And that is the non-medical use of plastic. And I'm concerned for example, that the plastic industry is using this epidemic to promote the use of uh, disposable plastic containers for food, or et cetera, et cetera, when in fact what we know protects that protects us from COVID is social distancing, hand washing, universal wearing of masks, et cetera. So um, we need to make sure that, you know, um, in our pursuit to tackle, you know, COVID-19, we don't create new forms of environmental pollution. Thank you. I'm back. Exactly. I'm back and yes, thank you for your patience. Uh, something went wrong with my Zoom, but I'm back now. I hope I'm clear. Yes, uh, we are in PH lab and uh, Dr. Uh, Ginto was talking also about climate smart coastal health systems, right? Have you discussed that already while I was briefly away? Yes, uh, I, I talk about this, this new framework for future health systems. We need to make sure they're climate smart, pandemic ready, universal, and, and high quality. We need to make sure people are happy when they leave the health facility and, and they don't you know, feel you know, uncomfortable and, and unsafe. Okay, since we are an archipelago and we know that our coastal communities and barangays are some of the poorest in the country despite the natural resources, the wealth of our marine environment, how do you operationalize and simplify and really help the barangays in the coastal areas with so-called climate smart health systems, especially during a pandemic? Could you tell us uh, how PH Lab can capacitate our barangay health workers, our barangay captains and vulnerable populations in coastal areas for so-called climate smart health systems in coastal areas because when we speak this way we understand each other but we have to one two three four five the abc's of what do we actually mean and how do we do it Dr. thanks deputy yes thanks deputy speaker and and you know i will admit it's more challenging now because our health systems are so overwhelmed our health workforce uh, you know, are, are starting to get burned out because of the pandemic response. And so it's, it's definitely more challenging now than during the pre-pandemic uh, phase or, 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 or era. Uh, but I think there are several opportunities. One is, you know, for example, and, and I, I'm sure you all know, uh, there's this such a thing as the LCCAP, the Local Climate Change uh, Action Plan. And in my dissertation, I reviewed LC caps of several coastal municipalities and health is really absent or near absent in the construction of these local plans. And so we need to make sure that the municipal health officer and the health workers are part of that decision making and planning process to make sure that, that you know, health investments are, are considered um, in uh, the planning of long, longer term climate resilience at the local level. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, education of, of, of health workers, uh, you know, um, right now the curriculum of uh, health workers has, has, you know, is, is close to, has, has no climate change uh, content uh, virtually. And so we need to make sure that health workers really receive, uh, you know, training on how to manage climate sensitive diseases. And what are these climate sensitive diseases? I mentioned a while ago, you know, infectious diseases like dengue, uh, undernutrition, for example, so on and so forth. And then finally, I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of health care facilities in the countryside do not even have uh, access to electricity. And so, for example, uh, 
you know, we need electricity to ensure that vaccines are actually uh, uh, preserved and, and, you know, the cold chain uh, is, is being preserved. And so how can we solarize, for example, our barangay health centers so that you don't just address the problem of energy security in healthcare, but you also decarbonize the local community. Uh, and so the health facility does not anymore get their electricity from, let's say, a fossil fuel uh, stores, uh, like, a carb, uh, like a coal power plant. So those are some of the, the options that we have, uh, Deputy Speaker, for uh, making sure our health systems uh, become climate smart. It will be good to have a template of what a climate smart uh, coastal barangay health system would be that perhaps you as a young climate reality leader could present to the League of Barangay Captains, uh, especially for those in the coastal areas. That will be great. Very good. Uh, the, there's so much we, it's 11.20 and we're uh, one hour and 20 minutes, uh, but we want all our climate reality leaders to stay on and Najreen, our next will be Russell. Russell is, yeah, we're back in Region 6, we're back in Iloilo, in Santa Barbara. Yes, can you introduce our colleague, uh, our colleague, ha, nakikisama ko, ha? <laughs> uh, Russell is with us, uh, introduce her and uh, the climate action she has done for Iloilo. Okay, Russell will be um, talking about the role of the youth in crafting national plans and strategies as part of the 12 National Youth Parliament. So, go ahead, uh, Russell. Okay. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Um, before I start, can I ask you for my presentation to be up? And while we're setting that up, I want to thank you, uh, all my Iloilo friends, um, uh, the climate strikers in Iloilo and everyone. So yes, uh, I am Rosal Morales. Uh, I'm part of the 12 National uh, Youth Parliament under the National Youth Commission. I'm the current uh, chairperson of uh, the Committee of Environment. But uh, aside from the legislative part uh, of my work, I also think that tama po yung sinabi ng ating mga kasamahan dito. Uh, I'm very inspired by Dr. Renz, Paula, and everyone. Now we should uh, and also, uh, Senator Ligarda, of course, you paved the way for us to be here right now. So what we need to do is action. The time to, of talk is over. Uh, so that should be symbiotic or sabay po siya sa pagalaw natin on the ground. So I'm also part of I Am Climate Justice. Uh, I'm part, uh, currently, um, ginagawa na po namin ng alternative community online, yung barter gulan. Kung meron po tayong barter for clothes and other material needs, which is very important to create a circular economy, meron po tayong, uh, we encourage also uh, skill sharing and community solidarity through uh, uh, skill sharing and uh, what that, I'll discuss more on that later. And also I'm part of uh, Alternative Mobility PH, um, crafting or and lobbying legislation for um, alternative mobility para sa mga biker lanes natin and whatever uh, and whatnot. Next, please. Okay. So, um, as I've said, uh, before I discuss this slide, I want to thank you, Senator, uh, Deputy Speaker Ligarda na po ngayon, no? You paved the way for us, not only uh, in the legislation, but inspiring us women to uh, lead. Uh, si Ms. Nadrin po, I see her a dedication sa aming mga climate reality leaders. Uh, I also want to thank uh, all of my communities, including Ananda Marga, Climate Strikers, Green Education Family, Wisely or University of Montana Family. Uh, thank you for telling me to speak my truth, especially to Heidi Blair and Nikki Fair, and to the 180 youth organizations all over the Philippines who reach out about the need for genuine youth leadership. That's something I will talk about later. And some of our partners on the ground, such as the One Million Lights Philippines, which provide which will provide us with solar lamps para sa isang community namin na IP sa Katsiguran Aurora at ang um, booklet one that will um, help us with putting up library. So these are all inspired by you po, um, Deputy Speaker Ligarda, um, the five legislations na binanggit niyo po kanina uh, and all that. Pero before po ako nagsimula uh, sa legislation uh, and all this creating of alternative spaces, nagumpisa po talaga ako sa Let's Do It Philippines. Um, uh, Pumupulot na basura, uh, uh, organizing cleanup drives sa Tigbawan. Salamat po sa local government ng Tigbawan, ng Gimbal, 
uh, ng Miagao at ng San Joaquin at marami pa pong iba. Also to Santa Barbara where I came from. Uh, okay, I'll go straight to my presentation. Um, so the youth eh, and majority of groups or communities have long been asking for an alternative to this current system. Alam naman po natin na we know and feel that we deserve better. Uh, kaya po tayo nandito because we want to have a better reality. So uh, I'm here uh, this morning, very privileged to ask those uh, to ask questions. I might not provide the answers, but I want to provide questions. So we, our mind will be, especially the youth who are watching right now. Ma, ma, ano po tayo, maka come up with tayo with other uh, solutions. So, uh, I'm just 23. Madami pa po kung dapat malaman sa ating mga uh, climate reality leaders na nandito na mas, na mas alam yung uh, uh, environments ng uh, dialogue, spaces, and whatnot. Pero gusto ko rin pong i-bring yung uh, tanong na how can we make alternatives and create a better future? Because we know that our status quo is based on exploitation. So, kuha lang po lang tayo ng tuha. I mean, kuha lang po tayo ng kuha. And we know that when we base our systems on exploitation, we will be drained. Hindi lang po ang environment natin, pero tayo po bilang tao ang mental health po natin. Because kung kuha lang po na tayo ng kuha, ganun po yung paningin natin sa ating environment, it also follows in our relationships with other people. Baka kuha lang po rin tayo ng kuha. So uh, uh, that's what I want to talk about uh, today. So uh, what we need is balanced revolu revolution. We need not only the youth to step up, the civil society, but also the government. It's a two-way process po uh, in their mandate, specifically po the National Youth Commission who's supposed to represent us. And I'll talk this more about on the next slide. Please, on my next slide. So um, ngayon gusto ko pong pag-usapan yung youth agenda and um hindi po PDP <laughs> hindi po yan uh, ano uh, um grupo it's PYDP po or Philippine Youth Development Plan uh, according po sa Philippine Youth Development Plan na pinasa po natin dapat by 2020 ang kabataan healthy educated patriotic active citizens na pero ngayon madami pa pong challenges na kailangan po nating uh, solusyunan um uh, siguro uh, kailangan nating tanungin kung is NYC really stepping up to provide that to us. Uh, also same for the living in peaceful, secure, and socially inclusive society. The youth should be able to engage in gainful economic activity and the youth should be able to access and use technology and services. But what's happening on the ground? Um, yung top priority po ng 12 national youth parliament are Regulation of single-use plastic. So we've been lobbying that both local and national legislation. Second, agripreneurship. Pag, um, make uh, agriculture sexy for the youth para um, we educate more uh, youth to be interested in agriculture. And then uh, teenage pregnancy, um, uh, solution yung teenage pregnancy. And then um, madami pa po kaming uh, bills na ipasa uh, both national and local. Pero um, yung, yung challenge po talaga namin, um, kasi hindi lang po ako nandito as a climate reality leader. Nandito rin po ako bilang kabataan. I'm just, as I've said, I'm just 23. Uh, so what we need the NYC to do is really listen to us. Meron po tayong priorities. These are our priorities. Sana po dito tayo mag-focus at sana naririnig po natin sila sa usapin ng education, yung pag-continue pag po ng uh, pag-continue po ng classes uh, uh, despite the um, despite the uh, lack of access to technology and, and, and whatsoever. At sinabi po, me Dr. Renz rin kanina if I'm if, if I'm right the healthcare workers are overwhelmed and burned out ganun din po sa ating educators na nandiyan sa number 1 natin na, na, na number 1 natin na dapat na priority um you know the youth is very diverse um marami po kaming opinion merong pro sa uh, sa mga sa policy uh, ng NYC meron uh, I'll make it as an example, but I won't say what my stand is. Uh, we probably we can discuss this other time. Uh, ang personal stand ko po sa um, 
uh, yung personal stand ko po is different from other personal stand. What we what we want is actually to be listened to to be listened to. So We just, uh, before going to my next slide, I just want to say that if NYC is the representative of this administration to the youth, that tells us one thing. Baka hindi po tayo yung priority. And I'll let them answer that. You know, may, meron din po silang mga initiatives. We just want to be included. Next po. So, yun po. As I said, we just need to ask the right questions to come up with the right answers. Ang gagaling po ng mga kasama ko dito, ang gagaling ng mga, and very inspiring. Um, so we have to, to ask, what's happening? Are we focusing on our priorities? Is the current system just, fair, and, equip and equitable for everyone? If not, why? At sinasabi ko po, bago po ako magtapos, human rights or climate justice and creating alternatives is a collective goal. Hindi po siya pula, hindi po siya dilaw, hindi po siya green, or ano pong kulay. No one political spectrum had the monopoly on that. We, especially the youth, should be at the forefront in deciding our future because our future, because we will be the one to inherit all of this, good or bad po. The role of the older generation is to facilitate and not dictate. We are tired of token representation. I have attended a lot po of youth dialogue and we are still here in the same system, nakikinig po pa talaga sila sa amin or gusto lang nila ng stamp pad sa kung ano nila, kung anong gusto po nila. Um, siguro I'll let them answer that. Pero thankful pa rin po ako sa spaces like this na binigay ng, ng office ni Senator Lauren Legarda because napapakinggan po talaga kami. And um, sa NYC po, um, ayaw na po namin ng slip service ninyo. We want action. If you're genuine in representing us, act on it. Show us through your actions. The future is for the youth and we will claim it no matter what. We will do it within our the boundary of our um of our capacity. So next po. Ayan, papakita ko na lang po, uh, hindi ko na po matatapos yung presentation ko, but these are the uh, example of alternatives that we're making right now. Um, as I said, barter gulan, alt mobility, uh, kung, uh, yung sabi namin sa alt mobility, commuters naman. Tapos, uh, indigenous children's education projects sa mga bata namin sa Aurora. And then, um, uh, I also share, I also share po yung vegetarian journey ko at uh, saka thoughts on alternatives sa Tita Thinks saka sa vegetarian tita in Instagram. And then, next slide. Tatapos na po ako, promise. <laughs> so, ito po lagi ko sinasabi. The personal is political. This is about accountability and transparency. This is holding everyone accountable. Even if I started working when I was 17 to afford my education, I was given privileges in life. So, it's about holding myself accountable. Kung paano ko ito magagamit. At also, for everyone, kung paano niyo po ito magagamit. So, yun po. Um, last slide. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, when we question the, tatus, the status quo and actively create a better world, we not only give justice to ourselves, but to every other individual or community that are being oppressed by the current system. And we all deserve better. Next. We want to help the youth to start asking the right questions so we get the right solutions. So creating a future requires a holistic approach. Sama-sama po tayo. It needs to be intersectional, multifaceted, and inclusive. Let's dare to dream of a better future po sa mga kabataan natin, hindi lang po sa mga uh, 23, pero sa mga 17 and below pa po, because a better reality is possible. Maraming salamat po and thank you for this opportunity. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that was quite comprehensive. But what's important is that, am I seen already? Yes. Am I heard? Nasreen, we're good? Okay. From Santa Barbara, Iloilo, we proceed to Mindanao, to Bukidnon. And one of the issues closest to my heart are first, the Mindanaoans, indigenous people. And second, of course, the zero waste movement because as the principal author and sponsor of the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, written in 1998 when I was your age and passed 
uh, three years later in 2001 and still continuing its implementation where 25% of the country of local governments are implementing RA9003. So I would like to know from uh, our zero waste leader from uh, Bukidnon. Is it Bukidnon? Let me see. Yes, Jessica no, uh, is from Malay Balay, Bukidnon. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are you with an IP group or you are wearing, um, is it a Mandaya or is it an Irainon Bukidnon? It's a uh, Sinabaang. Uh, ah, Sinabaang. Yes, po. Um, people here wear it usually um, to work. This is yeah. actually a uniform uh, from uh, from my tita that I uh, that I asked from her because uh, the the one that I have that was passed on to me by my grandma who is a Manobo from the Agusan Marsh is um. Uh, I left it in Ligan. I'm I'm originally from Lanao del Norte. Um, where I, I'm part Manobo, so I, I should be wearing that. <laughs> um, okay. The yes, but um, for for now, um, I'm I, I would wanna um, highlight the culture of Bukidnon since this is my second home now. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. I love that part of, of the Philippines as as I do, of course, my home province of Antique, and yes. I have similar indigenous people's uh, outfits. You are a Manobo, part of Manobo. We appreciate uh, their culture much. Um, I know that uh, there are also uh, Panay Bukidnon in Antique, but Irainon Bukidnon, I think, in Bukidnon. I'm not certain if uh, that IP group is also present there. But maybe the Usapang indigenous people can be later on. Uh, yeah. Tell us about... Uh, the Zero Waste Academy. It's a Zero Waste uh -huh. Academy. Uh, what was established by the DILG? Uh, is that what, are we talking about the same group or is this different? And I, what are you doing with mm -hmm. the Zero Waste Academy as a climate reality leader? How are you uh, uh, training people to actually mm -hmm. implement uh, ESWM? Uh, yes, uh, yes, for um, deputy. That those are really good questions. Um, actually, to be honest with you, we just started um, learning the zero waste program by um, the Kamikatsu uh, town uh, from the Kamikatsu town in um, in Japan. They are actually a model town um, which have already implemented. I think you can correct me. Um, around eighty one to eighty three percent. Um, to zero waste, uh, to their zero waste program, they actually have forty-five types of 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 trash categories. Uh, no, uh, forty-five types of uh, forty-five types of trash uh, under thirteen categories. Um, so we're still trying to set that up first. Um, um, but right now we're planning to also conduct a um, an eco. Camp, uh, an eco leaders camp online, as inspired by the global training um, that was conducted by uh, the Climate Reality Project. So we're still trying to do that um, uh, right now um, as we speak. But um, can next slide. Yes, um, uh, before the pandemic, we were very active in gathering people, uh, youth to be exact. Um, during the annual National Cleanup Day, it's, uh, it's turning six years old um, this September. Um, so congratulations to our national convener, Dan Diaz, um, who started it um, as a brainchild of the Let's Do It Philippines. And now it has evolved into the National Cleanup Day Coalition, uh, which I am, a, I am one of the coordinators of, uh, the Mindanao coordinator. Um, so right now, during the pandemic, um, okay, um, uh, we are still talking with the other communities, with the community leader, um uh as as our direct contact um as you as you can see the the upper left uh, i mean upper right um uh, picture is from lgu of barugo leite uh they have created a shared garden space to mitigate local food insecurity due to pandemic um they they conducted um this program for everyone to have like a shared food space 
Um, so in the lower right photo, um, that was done last month, uh, June 18 to be exact. Uh, those are our echo leaders from Gilutungan Island in Cebu. Um, they gladly shared this photo during the lockdown. Um, and just an FYI for everyone um, thinking why they are not socially distancing themselves or not even wearing a mask. Um, I was told by uh, Dan Diaz that they have zero cases there uh, for COVID. So thankfully, um, they are safe. Um, our echo leaders there are safe. And so they're still campaigning for the National Cleanup Day set on um, the third Saturday of September because that's the that's uh, the set date every year that we conduct um, the National Cleanup. Um, Very good that you gave us a gave us a heads up on the uh, <laughs> National Cleanup Day in September. I take note of that uh, just to remind all the my staff in the Climate Change Commission to prepare a webinar on stories for a better normal, focusing. Mm -hmm. on the National Cleanup Day, where perhaps we could have Jessica again with all the zero waste advocates uh, by then, okay? Um, yes, yes. So that, that us, would be great. Uh, aside from campaigning, how do you implement as a mother, as an indigenous person, uh, as someone who just like me loves the weaves and mm -hmm. passing on uh, indigenous peoples tangible and intangible heritage to people, but how do you actually uh, implement zero waste in your home, mm -hmm. in your barangay, in your community? Yes, well, that's a great question. Uh, for me, I, um, I actually started my advocacy when I had my first child in 2014. Um, it, it made me realize that, hey, what, what would be the next step for me? As, uh, as an environmental advocate. Um, and then I, I, I taught myself to, you know, search around Facebook and then um, all my friends. I, so one of my friends, um, she introduced me with a cloth diapering. Uh, it's, a, it's the modern version of the lampin. Um, I wish I could share a photo of that, but um, it's it's uh, it actually comes from it actually comes with a lot of designs, uh, and we have a lot of groups uh, dedicated for that here. Uh, we also include dads to be in that group, so we have um, we have as well um, push towards uh, healthy and non fast food eating for our children. Um, to do away with uh, single-use plastics when we try to buy fast food. Um, if we cannot really do away with fast food, we try to bring um, our own containers. So I've tried that before. Um, uh, I, I guess it was kind of, kind of new way back then. Um, people bringing in their containers, like a baon. And then in a drive through I actually gave my... Um, uh, baonan to the to the lady and then she was like um what's this for ma'am uh and I said can you kindly put that in there uh the food that I ordered um so this this lady uh she was kind enough to oblige my request even though it was so weird I had to explain um I guess this is very important um because pe because um being an environmental advocate is not everyone's cup of tea because they have it's not their fault um i guess it's the way they were brought up and probably it's a nature nurture kind of thing and for me i was lucky and privileged enough to have a lot of resources um that taught me the importance of the environment um now i digress i digress now but uh, going back to my moment with with a fast food uh, takeaway, um, I had to explain. And for us um, advocates, we should be patient um, in explaining to others because if we um, if we immediately um, get insulted because this is our lifestyle, it would cut the message across, um, and so it defeats the purpose of educating the the. The general, uh, the general public. Um, so I, I had to explain, even though it took me um, quite a longer time uh, in, in, in the queue, uh, in the drive-through. So I had to explain to the manager himself why I'm doing it. And um, 
so he was very kind uh, to give me my re- uh, to give me my request and it it starts with you uh, and then when this what for example if if those uh, if those um, food servers heard me they would actually think about what i said like even though even though i know most of the time people think i'm weird doing all those kinds of things uh, in public um I guess that's my part. That's my role as a mom because my kids see me all the time. Uh, I have a six-year-old and I have a one-year-old. Uh, during the Manila training in 2016, um, I brought my one-year-old with me. Uh, I, I had him um, tag me along in the three-day training. And I think he cried in the middle of Al Gore's um, uh, the exclusive uh, video recording session. So I had to run uh, past everyone in their ta- uh, from their tables to the outside with the crying baby in, in, my, in my arm. So I guess it started from there. And then it evolved to my personal advocacies in uh, solid waste management. And, uh, um, and I guess I really wanted to emphasize on sustainable consumption and production because um, I, I'm also one of the ambassadors for the uh, UNEP uh, Switch Asia project for sustainable consumption and production in the Philippines, um, all over Asia and the Pacific. Uh, so we try to emphasize on getting our local, uh, getting resources from our local communities. Um, next slide, please. Um, I want to go to. Um, I want to emphasize on. Um, the myths that we have as consumers or as, as, as advocates or as people who want sustainable consumption and production. Uh, there's some around that informed consumers are sustainable. Because um, there is this mindset, uh, I'm not saying everyone, but there is a mindset that um, a person is already informed. Um, he already is an environmentalist because one, um, there's a knowledge action gap. There's a thing that we call a knowledge action gap. Um, You know, as a person, what is environmental friendly or not, but you don't do it. You don't take action. Second is the small action trap. Uh, One example is um, people buying uh, um, steel straws or bamboo straws and then they're thinking that oh okay this is enough this is enough for me to be an environmentalist or to be an advocate it is but the first step um so you can move forward actually it's just the first step and may it be the gateway to you being um uh, an environment advocate in your community um and and third is the lack of access accessible sustainable options um uh, uh, right now, we are just lucky enough that a lot of a lot of entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurs are popping up because of the pandemic. Um, moms creating soaps uh, by hand. Um, um, my friends uh, um, making their own food in their own kitchen. Um, a lot of sustainable options are already available in the community. I guess you just have to. Um, you just have to search on them because it, the information is already available. Use Facebook, use Facebook, Facebook Market. It's our, it's, it's right there. And luckily enough, um, here in in our region, um, specifically in CDO, we have a collective in there that um, encourages us MSMEs and um, handmade products, um, eco friendly products that are made locally. So we have cosmetics, um, to cosmet- a, a, a mom who does cosmetics, um, a person who does uh, soaps and empowers a lot of the women in the community because of her um, seminars and the list goes on. So for, for me, um, a sustainable consumption and production advocate, um, I, I would like to emphasize on, um, you know, protecting already sustainable practice uh, practices, like promoting less materialistic and less polluting traditional practices. Um, one of which is my personal project, uh, along with my husband's, 
because he works in the in an IP community also here. Um, and 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 then we have to protect the segments living within the sustainable limits. And um, yes, again, protecting the micro SMEs. Um, second is that we have to shift our social context around consumer behavior. Um, although we also have to take account the responsibilities of the bigger companies on their um, on their action towards environmental protection, we also have to think about what we do as an individual. Um, for example, um, one we have uh, we make the sustainable option as a default. You uh, as simple as bringing your own bag or bringing your own container or bringing your own tumbler um, that's 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 sustainable um, for example getting your your produce in the local market or your local farmer instead of buying from malls for, uh, malls that have resources coming from the abroad um, we I, I'd also like to emphasize on providing actionable info, such as you know education. And my my other my other echo leaders in this call um, is also doing that in in the education platform. Um, third would be to highlight positive examples. I think it would encourage a lot of the people in the community to you know see uh, see that one person is doing a really great job, and so it creates a ripple effect. And it encourages collaborative behaviors, and I think that is already happening right now in in my local in my locality um, in CDO uh, to be specific. Now um, we also have to address the inequality. So um, using progressive taxes, uh, basic utilities, subsi subsidizing um, subsidizing, for example, the electricity. I know for uh, I know before I. I you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, our viewers can correct me if I'm wrong. That a, a town in uh, a town in Negros Oriental is being subsidized uh, with um, with a uh, energy development corporation. Uh, they have a subsidy in there um, to share with their load um, in payment. So uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not. I'm not really sure, but it's just an example. And then. Free or subsidized public goods and services for low income, uh, for low income uh, families, and then again, uh, we we want to protect the micro enterprises. Um, I guess my um, I guess what I really want to impart is that we are not separate from the environment. Uh, we are actually part of the environment, and all of us are interconnected. And um, intergenerational responsibility that comes from me. Um, should be our conscious behavior in all that we do. So my my call to action is that if we do not act now, when? So thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Very good. Uh, you've covered so much, uh, not just on zero waste, but also on MSME. Again, uh, just like to remind all our climate reality leaders on the laws that we need to implement as author of the micro and small and medium enterprises law to promote and give assistance to our local artisans, whether you are an indigenous weaver or doing beadwork for your earrings or doing uh, recycle, uh, recycling material to use as your floor map or mosquitrapo in any way. Ang mga micro enterprises ay 99% ng ating local economy at yun ang dapat natin suportahan. So salamat Jessica sa iyong pag uh, uh, promote ng kultura ng mga katutubo na pagbibigay uh, ng tulong sa zero waste. What I would really challenge all our climate reality leaders on the screen, and this is something we have to work with with Red, is to make their homes models for ecological solid waste management and even send pictures of the trash bins and the recycled botelata plastic in the urban gardens or rural gardens in their backyard if uh, applicable and MRF and even vertical gardens on recycled materials. So even just that can be a uniform agenda for all our climate reality leaders. But thank you, uh, Jessica, for all that. Now I go you, to my from Mindanao, from Malay Balay, I'd like to visit you soon. I'd like to go back 
to my hometown. I miss Pandan so much. So I hope that you have pictures, uh, Carlo Alonsagay, of the cleanest river in the Philippines a few years ago. I hope it's still clean, the Bugang River. I hope you have pictures of our uh, marine <coughs> preserve, reserve, uh, Magaba, which is my barangay, and um, the Northwest Panay Peninsula. But I will forgive you if you don't have the pictures. Yes. So you will talk about climate educate. And what is climate educate? In these days of online virtual learning and hybrid learning, how are you uh, using what you started in 2016 as one of the youngest uh, climate reality leaders from my dear hometown, how are you also influencing our state university, Dr. Crespo? At kung hindi pa kayo nag-uusap, i-integrate natin ang climate educate, hindi lamang sa DepEd program under the Environmental Education Awareness Act, but also in state universities and colleges in Antique, in Region 6, and the country. Hi, Carlo. Hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, actually, uh, magagal is in my background. Carlo, JC. JC. Carlo, what John do we call you? Yes, John, Carl, Carl right. or JC? Uh, you can call me you can call me JC or Carl. It's okay. Okay, Carl. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, so good day everyone and thank you very much again, uh, Climate Reality Philippines and Deputy Speaker for this opportunity. I also uh, uh, personally looking forward to Deputy Speaker Legarda's uh, support for the creation of a mangrove protected area in Magaba Pananatika, which hopefully could be Antica's um, first uh, protected mangrove area, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which could be utilized as a climate adaptation and mitigation measure, and also to further empower our local communities in Pandan when it comes to sustainable tourism. So uh, next slide, please. So to have a short introduction, um, Climate Educate is a youth-led climate change education project. It was formed in, uh, after our climate reality training in Manila in 2016. So uh, we first collaborated with fellow climate reality leaders here in the Philippines, in Nepal, and in Brazil. After a few years, we grew our uh, project team as a uh, community of students, youth advocates, uh, young professionals, researchers, and educators. So the primary aim of the project is to promote climate change education in different schools and communities here in the Philippines and in different parts of the global south that we're in. Uh, next slide, please. So um, most of our initiatives were classified into two. So the first one is called non-online initiatives. And then the second one is uh, the online initiative. Uh, so example of our non-online initiatives would be school outreach, um, community seminars, workshops, tree planting activities, uh, community cleanup drives, and collaboration with other youth and community organizations. So um, before the pandemic, mo most of our activities, which were started by our team in Nepal, were supported through volunteer work or um, limited funding because we started the project with no funding at all. So our collaboration within the project team is virtual. Uh, that's why we divided our team into uh, regional hubs. Uh, all of our project members are from the global south. Uh, regional hubs are the smaller version of our teams in order for the support system and contextualizing the content of what we teach will be more feasible. Um, so lately, uh, we also gained some support and grant from the Climate Reality Project Australia and the Pacific through another project, which I will show in the last slides. So. Um, uh, however, the pandemic, like most of us has experienced, uh, forced us to adjust our project delivery and time frame uh, because most schools were closed, um, community quarantines were implemented, and there are regulated physical gatherings. Uh, we turned into the option of doing um, our initiatives and programs online, such as webinars and virtual workshops. So um, aside from doing initiatives for schools and communities, we also have a team for design and creatives doing the work for graphics and other learning materials, as you can see in the screen. Um, our learning materials are mostly flat vector graphics. Uh, these materials are used in our school and community outreach activities, blog articles, uh, social media posts, and can be modified for translation by our members who are not um, English uh, speakers. Uh, next slide, please. So um, these uh, learning materials are used in various initiatives done in more than 12 countries uh, since June 20, uh, 2016. Uh, so far, we have reached um, 70 uh, initiatives since uh, June 2016. Uh, all of them are non-online and online. So um, next slide, please. Uh, here in the Philippines, 
now that our education system slowly transits to um, distance and online learning, I think these are the best practices in the project that we can share. So the first one is the uh, next slide, please. Uh, the the use the first one is the use of appreciative inquiry. So um, it's actually for uh, um, for teachers, especially those teaching in civic engagement or science. Um, it's an approach based on uh, strength and positive change in organizational management. So it's a new approach that we are exploring to use in training fellow teachers and educators for climate change education. Um, we also already conducted appreciative inquiry summits online as well. Uh, can we go back to the last slide, please? Thank you. So um, the second uh, practice that we would like to share is the use of reflective and constructive instruction. Uh, we use reflective and constructive instruction in our school outreach activities, especially in learners in elementary and, or in high school. Aside from introducing climate change through a traditional lecture, uh, we try to engage them in different activities that involve collaboration, discovery, learning, and then reflection. In the reflection part, we provide guides and uh, sentences on how they could start uh, expressing their thoughts after doing something. And uh, the third one is the use of flat vector graphics, just like um, what, uh, what I presented. Uh, yeah, the use of flat vector graphics, which is always emphasized in most of our initiatives, because uh, most of um, our learners nowadays are more into visuals. So it's really an advantage for teachers if they use uh, Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator or even Canva. Uh, these are the skills that we also plan to um, share with other educators interested um, youth climate advocates. And the fourth one is educator to educator collaboration. Collaboration is really important for learning, especially for teachers. Um, through an online network that we created, we invited teachers from schools and communities that hosted our initiatives since 2016. So the network serves as a uh, platform for sharing of best practices, uh, sharing of materials and references, and other forms of virtual en engagement about climate change. So. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So these practices are all part of our current project uh, with the Climate Reality Project uh, Australia and the Pacific. Although the pandemic has somehow really affected our um, expected deliverables and other plans, we have, uh, we have adjusted and make everything uh, flexible for most of our team. So for our Nexus project, um, we aim to first boost teacher-to-teacher -teacher collaboration, not just domestically, but also globally. The second one is creation of both online and remote educational platform for climate change action learning, which is ongoing. And the third one is supporting our non-online initiatives or school and community outreach, uh, which we hope to resume if our current um, situation has improved. So um, to end my presentation, let me show you, uh, can you please go to the next slide, please, to the last slide. To end my presentation, let me show our small output as a team. Um, these are from our members from the Asia Pacific, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. So we would like to tell our fellow youth climate advocates here in our country and across the globe that together as one, we rise to fight the pandemic as we continue to save our planet. Thank you. JC, thank you very much for what you're doing uh, to educate the youth of our country. Uh, may I know whether this is already uh, actually uh, utilized by DepEd um, and who developed the programs? Are you continuing to update your programs on disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation and mitigation? And actually uh, to simplify, let's say the adaptation practices that can be applied uh, by the youth, uh, by local communities. So, so how do you um, update your content and um, allow more DepEd uh, schools to use it? and even elevate the level so that state universities and colleges can use what you are doing? Uh, we recently uh, made contact with the Department of Education's Office for um, Disaster Risk uh, Reduction and Climate Change. So um, uh, our content is usually uh, being updated by our team, uh, which is uh, mostly are not from the Philippines, but uh, we try to uh, simplify everything from the terms to uh, the science. And um, uh, we, we try to uh, update it from time to time as we go on through uh, collaboration with other teachers within our network. 
Very good. Are you doing that full time or do you also do mangrove reforestation in our hometown? Um, I'm also a full-time teacher. I'm actually here in their school. And at the same time, I'm um, collaborating with the local government uh, in Pandan regarding uh, the mangrove uh, project that we had. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'd like to talk to you more. Unfortunately, it's been two hours and uh, it's never enough. Uh, we should do two episodes yes, okay. of our climate reality. Uh, and and uh, But we'll be in touch, JC. Thank you so very much for that. And... Um, Last but not least, uh, we have Hillary. Okay, Hillary Howe has been with us um, two hours ago. Tell us more about um, the on the on the um, not on the job, but really the grassroots uh, programs that you do um, in um, in the global. Uh, you're part of the global shapers. Uh, during my time in um, the World Economic Forum, they called us a different name, but it's probably similar to uh, what you represent, the global shapers, if this is part of the World Economic Forum. So you're a global shaper of the Manila hub. And um, tell us about uh, the, um, the the company that you work with is with um, Ayala Corporation, is that correct? Yeah, and right. um, tell us about how the training as a climate reality leader four years ago has influenced you and has um, improved perhaps the company that you uh, continue to work with. Okay, thanks Thanks so much everyone. Hi everyone. Um, I'll try to keep my portion short, but I'll touch on the, the points that, um, that, that that was mentioned. So uh, I'm Hillary. Uh, I'm Hillary. I work as in AC Infra. I'm an, so that makes me an IALA citizen. Um, I'm a global shaper for the Manila Hub. That's right. Um, it's under the World Economic Forum, and I'm a climate reality leader. And was just trained last year in Tokyo in 2019. So that's a little bit about me. Um, next slide. Um, I have so I'll talk about the projects, the grassroots projects that I'm in. Uh, in 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 this particular format, I have three focus areas. Uh, first is waste management. Second is youth education, and third, and this one is very, very close and uh, close to my heart, is nutrition. Next slide, please. So for waste management, um, this is really in line with what the, the work that I, uh, not really in line with the work that I do, but I try to help out. And this is uh, this is aligned with what the, some of the work that AC Infra does is um, we deal with waste management. And um Ayala as a company, we take sustainability seriously. Um, we measure and include sustainability targets in our annual report, in, 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 in reports that we produce annually. And some of the projects that we're involved in first is a project we call Walang Plastikan. So if you see on the slide here on the left-hand side, um, it's a company-wide initiative to clean, sort, and proper, properly upcycle plastics. So we decided to start with plastics before we go with the other, um, the other segregation, the other mode, uh, the other types to segregate, uh, and it, it's been really, um, we've we've been we've been really surprised to see the support that in within the company in participating and really clean cleaning and segregating their plastic. Um, aside from that, our company also assists with an MRF project. That's the picture on the bottom right side. Um, an MRF project with Barangay Poblacion in Muntinlupa, really enabling and encouraging um, this community to transition the, the barangay um, to do the same. So clean, collect, and upcycle their plastics into bricks and other materials. Um, and then next slide, please. So that's it for waste management. Next, um, on youth education, I, I put a quote here I got from one of my friends, Joshua Lopez, who's with Reboot Philippines, who said that um, I think it's while while we, it's very important we have the right leaders in place to support you know to to support the world that we'd like to see. Um, it's very important that we, and especially the youth, know what we want to say and what we want you know what we want for this world. So uh, this is where my role in Global Shapers and in Climate Reality comes in. So the training that I've attended last year really equipped me with the skills and the knowledge um, to really share this with a bigger audience. Um, I did my first presentation with the Global Shapers community earlier this year. I had hoped to schedule a couple more presentations, but the pandemic hit. But, you know, I think we shouldn't let this, 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 
um, set us back, and we just got to we just have to find um, new ways to engage and connect with our audience and to send our climate message across. Um, uh, aside from that, though I did try, so the the recently concluded climate reality trade global climate reality training, I was a mentor and um, facilitated the training for. Um, 15 different uh, individuals all uh, across uh, Asia. And I think it's, it was a very good experience because you're, you're able to learn and, and share what works in other regions and possibly something that we could implement here in the Philippines as well. Um, this is just very, very quickly. And the last one, I'd like to talk about uh, nutrition. So nutrition is very, very personal for me and it's my biggest passion because I really love food. I grew up in a family that loved to cook and loved to eat. Um, on, Insta, so on Instagram, on my account, uh, I, I really talk about the intersection of food, culture, and nutrition because um, we, can, we can try it. I, I personally advocate for a healthy, well-balanced diet. But if it's not, if we're not sensitive to what the culture is or what people in a certain, you know, what the people are used to eating, they're, they're going to push it aside. And so I am taking this plant-based nutrition offered by Cornell University right now. And I've and and most recently during the quarantine, I've worked with this uh, this chef in Cebu uh, to develop easy, affordable family meals um, under 100 for a fam for a family of five using the relief goods. So think what you can do to upgrade a can of sardines or pancit canton. It doesn't just have to be there. You could add a few vegetables and you can make it something more nutritious for the family. And I think it's very important that I, I find nutrition very important today because um, you, you can see from the cases like you have resurgence in Vietnam, you have resurgence in so many places. There's a second wave. And the best defense for us now in T19 is really a strong immune system, keeping ourselves healthy. Um, and I think that's one of our best contributions to our, our fight with COVID today. All right, next slide, please. And um, touching on that, if I can, just very, very quickly um, before we wrap up, uh, I'd like to talk about how each of anyone listening on this call could possibly adopt a more balanced um, diet in their lives. I, I personally use this uh, guide from uh, offered by the Harvard School of Public Health on the healthy eating plate. About half fruits, half to your plate should be fruits and vegetables. About one fourth whole grains. Um, it can be brown rice, red rice, black rice, corn, oatmeal, and um, one one half of one fourth healthy protein, um, lean meats. Uh, 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 ano, garbanzos, mung bean, mungo, all of these things. And there's so many ways and it doesn't have to be limiting. I've I put pictures here on the right to show you it, it's not just salad. It's just that you have more greens on your plate. And I encourage people to um, adopt that. Next slide, please. And why do I say this? I think I, I'd like to talk about my story very briefly and why I follow this guide. So I, I have been speaking to many people and I think it's, this is why it's important for us to talk to people outside of our, our natural circles. Um, I spoke to somebody from overseas who, who, who was telling me that things like, um, things like dialysis centers are not so common and yet here in the Philippines, I think we see one in every, in every barangay, in every, barangay or every city. It's common here for people to be scared or to hear relatives that have diabetes or who are obese or who have hypertension. And I feel like it's not some it's not it's something that we shouldn't accept. It's not it doesn't have to be um, the standard, and we can do better. And we really need to change that. Um, part of it is probably I feel that most Filipinos don't think they're fat just because we're a very slender um we're, we're very slender people and so what we we may have this perception that to be obese is to be american obese you know slightly bigger but for us um just because it doesn't look like they've gotten so round doesn't mean that um you're not actually fat on the inside and i think that's something we need to change i personally was this this thing called skinny fat i looked like i was i was i was i was slender but inside i was actually carrying a lot of um, fat in between my organs. Okay, next slide. Please. So that's very brief about me, but um, just as a takeaway for anyone listening, I I'd like to share my principles on selecting what to eat. Again, I go back to I I nutrition and food is really something that I'm passionate about, and I think this is um, something 
that shouldn't be too difficult to incorporate in our lives and, and in a way it uh, it 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 does it has it has an effect on the climate um with if we if we eat more balanced that's more fruits and vegetables and that's actually um less strain on the plan uh, that's less strain on the planet because we, we consume less meat and we the, we need to we need to raise less cattle and also my guiding principles it's eat um the first one honestly it's it's finding a why you'd like to eat health, healthy or you'd, you'd like to eat balanced. Um, it's not really, being healthy is such a vague term. I don't think that's something that motivates anyone. But put in, like, keep in mind or like, identify what you, for me, I, I need identifying what I, what, what, what I should eat. What, will it energize me to be my best? Will it give me the energy to work out more will it give me the energy to for example for somebody that has a po um will eating this foods um allow me to play with my with my with my apo will it allow me to live a long and healthy life to see my grandchildren or, or things like that um or to, to come to work and do the best that i can or to, to do the best that i can for my advocacies uh the second one is appreciate knowing that these kinds of foods are good for me what i can what what steps can i take to slowly appreciate at in the beginning especially if you're coming from a diet that's really um oily and fried and high sodium which is you know any filipino dish i think um uh, I, I adobo is delicious with so much rice and all um but knowing that these that what you know knowing that there is a better diet out there how can i how could I better appreciate the food? Will it um, is it slow incremental? Is it is it slowly re- reducing the amount of sodium until so I learn to appreciate lightly salted foods? Things like that. And the third, um, lastly, is tea. Uh, it's it's about what I can tweak. In but in is is what I choose to eat. Will it help tweak the system towards a more sustainable planet? So. Recently, and I put a picture here of, C- of CSA. Recently, I've subscribed to this company called the Good Food Community that um, works with works with farmers. And we're, the system is quite novel because you because you buy a share into the farm, and so regularly, week on week, depending on how long you commit your pledge, is you are delivered fresh organic produce from these farmers. Um, really, really promoting them to plant organic. Um, to plant right and to plant healthy for the soil. So, um, I think that the, those are the three things that I, I I follow, and I think these are the three things I that would be helpful for anyone listening to um, select what to eat and how to eat much much better. So, thank you um, so much, Hillary. Um, natutuwa ako na yung mga ginagawa ko sa buhay <laughs> ang mga advocacy ng ating mga mga batang climate leaders. Um, do you know, Hillary, that I grow my own food? Oh really? Wow. I've, yes. Um I've not uh, purchased any vegetable from any palengke or grocery. Basta na sa bahay ako pero pag nagta-travel, syempre I have to eat what's served. Uh I grow my own food. Uh bawal na bawal, parang mortal sin na bumili ng gulay or herbs at hindi ako gumagamit ng mga sahog na puro natural at uh, uh yung pampaasim, kung hindi batuan, libas, kung hindi sampalok tas ang aking uh, almusal palaging may uh, talbos ng kamote o kaya uh, diningding o kaya uh, fresh green salad na akong nagtatanim uh, hindi wala akong malaking farm pero uh, talagang minamaximize ko yung pagtatanim ng gulay at akong gumagawa ng sarili kong fertilizer mula sa food waste at uh, at lahat ng aking kinakain maliban sa uh, karne na bihirang-bihira ako magkarne, una bawal ang baboy at karne pero minsan nakakalusot pati ang manok kumakain lamang ako pag ito ay free range at pag organic ang kinakain ng manok at syempre bawal ang mga condiments na mga debote o delata at sorry na lang sa mga advertiser na delata bawal ang delata sa aking bahay kaya um mm-hmm. <laughs> so Galing. bawal kami ang debote ang delata, bawal ang may MSG, sorry na lang yung gusto mag-commercial ang MSG at lahat ng aking um, pati mga patis at mga at uh, yung sorry sa mga chef pero ako yung mga aking sahog ay galing sa puno dahil lahat naman ng ating mga 
dahon ay merong um, uh, silbi, hindi ba? Kung pampaasim, hindi naman, ayaw kang magsabi ng brand, hindi naman kailangan bibili ng pampaasim sa grocery. Correct. Pwede ka naman, kung meron kang tanim na libas, na uh, batwan, at uh, sa palok, at Kahit mayaba. Kahit wapa. Oo, po po. So, natutuwa ako sa plant-based diet ko. <laughs> dahil yan ay aking um, way of life sa mga nakaraang taon. After this, uh, Sheree, Uh, will call you. Um, magandang tulong din public service. Ilagay sa Facebook page mo, sa akin din. Ano ba yung mga plant-based uh, menu sa lower than 100 pesos na pwedeng ipamigay? Kasi tayo puro sa disaster, puro na lang a uh, delata mentality. Puro bibigay na lang ng mga noodles. Ayoko magsabi ng brand. Noodles at delata. Para bang killing me softly. di ba? It's so unhealthy. Um, na disaster na nga. Uh, na pandemya, tapos ang binibigay pa naka single use plastic delata na, debote pa may uh, sodium at saka MSG pa uh, ang sama-sama, pero kung ako ang ginagawa ko, yung talinom alam nyo yung talinom, wild lang yan eh yes, po. pero yes. talinom is a very good antioxidant plant so namimigay ako, naka bulto-bultong talinom, yun ang mga pinamimigay ko at hindi hindi ako nagdedelata, sorry na lang sa mga advertisers po Anyway, so Hillary um, and all of you, thank you so much. Uh, I have to read all the comments. So after this, this is not the last. Uh, Nashreen, um, I ask for nothing for myself. But what Climate Reality Philippines has to do is to push the way forward for all those who presented today, whether it is the education, climate educator of JC, or the plant-based nutrition, Our recipes and diet of Hillary, or the Zero Waste Academy um, of Jessica, that's implementing my 1998-2001 ESWM, and many more. Uh, let's do concrete examples in our homes, in our communities, and encourage other climate reality leaders and non-climate reality leaders to implement what you are already doing on a micro, micro level in your areas and i uh would want to 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 be with you in that uh Nashreen, if you could please make sure so that all these talk will not go to waste for after all it may start with a vision it may start with debates and talk but talk cannot save lives it is through our efforts in the local level urgent local climate action is most important and i wish that you would put that online so that others who may not know what climate action means will understand, ah, ganun pala. Kamukha ako, nagtatanim ako ng adlay. Yung tinatanim kong adlay na mas healthy kaysa sa white rice, no, Hillary, ay yung ang kinakain ng aking uh, household. At saka, ang aking household at lahat ng staff ko, Tala and Sherry, alam nyo yan, libre na ang kandilang tanghalian Uh, bago pandemya sa HOR, House of Rep, nagdadala ako ng organic na gulay uh, sa aming tanghalian araw-araw. Ako ang caterer sa Senado at sa House of Rep ng aking opisina sharing my baon with my staff. At saka, pangalawa, kanina may nagsabi about uh, um, utensils. I never, I say no to any uh, utensil kasi gumagawa kami ng bamboo Um, at uh, coconut made uh, coconut wood na utensils uh, sa antike. It, it can be done anywhere. It can be done bukid non anywhere. Anyway, so 12.20. I have to read a lot of, um, but we have to read this because ang daming, uh, you know, they made an effort to message on Facebook. So I just have to read it. City Zubaida Usman Murud. Good morning. Kanina pa siya nag ano eh. Axel Rose Salas, let's get it on. Aron Margazo Victoriano, good morning. New climate leader here, very good. Lon Maglipas, good morning. May Ritz de Lima, good morning from Belizon. Andre Ontal from Sibalum, very good. Maken, good morning from Mandaluyong. Guillan Adesas, good morning po. Aliza May Argente, good morning. Lon Maglipas, God bless Climate Reality Philippines. Rolando Echonova, good morning from Sultan Kudara State University. Sarah Jane Escario, good morning. Bianx Magulio, 
Romel Resurrection, ano mo nakakatuwa ah? Maraming mga pangalan nakikita ko every week na dyan. Nakakatuwa, meron tayong steady regular viewership. Gemma Regina Pestano Corpus. A little late today, but we'll definitely not miss this episode. Hindi balik kayong late kasi late mahaba rin kami. Okay. Si Sheila Diaz Meneses. Oh, from Leyte. Hi, Sheila. Jera Cortez. CRP Leaders. Good morning. Rafaela Merle. From Pagbilao, Quezon. Nako, I went there when I was a teenager. Flor Lopez de Leon. Good morning. Anselma Aurelio Leguarda. Hindi Legarda. Happy morning to all Antiquenos. Nakakatuwa. Dapat lahat ng Antiquenos manood kay JC. Okay. Corazon Blancha. Nice one, Deputy Speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, how to show people what we need to plant flowers or vegetables in our backyard. Nasreen, gawin nyo to. Um, yang mga forest garden, yang simpleng uh, maski sa paso, maski hindi nakatira sa farm, maski hindi nakatira sa may backyard, maski sa isang bintana, may isa ka lang na narisikulong bote o lata na merong halaman, masayan ako. So kailangan lahat ng climate leader may urban or rural garden. Ha, pangako, Nasreen, ha? Lon Maglipas, go Naz. Aba, may fan ka rito. Nino Pinalva, go Juan Carlo. Aba, meron kayo mga fans, ha? Angelica Pinlac, Rebusura, go Hilary Howe. May kanya-kanya silang pala. O sige, Beatriz Ann, proud climate reality leader, Climate Educate Project, represent dear friend, Sir Carl, aba, mestudyante ka, Mark Lindon Diaz, God is good all the time, it's true. Wilson Sayabok, good morning, proud leader from Talisay, Cebu, very good. Annie Castillo Leopoldo, hello to my niece. Jessica, go girl, proud of you. Nakakatuwa, oh, <laughs> may kanya-kanyang pala sila. Very good yan. And this will be posted on Facebook and YouTube in my Facebook and YouTube, but also in your respective Facebook. So people can just share and share and share this almost three hours. Oh, let me see. Okay, I have to wear my glasses. Rudemar Atilano de Cripito from City of the Smarinas in Cavite. Lourdes Alcalabreva. Lizelle Goleta from Belizon. God bless all of our good leaders like you. Salamat, duro gid mo salamat. Vanessa Carantes from Benguet. Hmm, in Baguio City. What's table 85? Nakakatuwa. Tapos nakaheart. Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda, such an inspiration. Thank you po. You all inspire me as well. Sofia Mansano, good morning. Rian, uh, Ryan Kuanan, hello to climate, uh, fellow climate leaders of 2016. Melody Garin, hello. Aba, mga climate reality leaders. Emma Pagunsan Bastonero. Proud of our Congresswoman, Duro Gid nga salamat. Seth Pilapil, I just how I just love how Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda engages the youth climate reality leaders. Wow! Enjoy ba kayo? Masyadong madaldal, hyper, di ba? Okay. Jonas Marie Dumdum, shout out to Table 72 of July 2020 batch. Ah, yung table nila nung training. Lex Tangangko, go Johnny Altomonte, go, go, go. Okay. Antonio Ingles. Okay. Anong ibig sabihin ng nosebleed? Anong ibig sabihin nun? Um, because they, so were, they were speaking, yes, they were speaking in English. That's why <laughs> it's a joke. Ah, kasi English kayo eh. Dapat kayo nag, ano, yes. Tagalog. Ngayon kayo. Ayun. Eh, huli na. O next, <laughs> next time, Tagalog. O sige. Lon, mag, tama nga sila. Um, Lon, maglipas. Marginalized groups in the Philippines will only really understand the situation of climate crisis by heart, and it will explain to them using their own language. Tama. Filipino, Bisaya, Ilocano, Kinaraya, Ilongo, iba-iba. Mm -mm. We should go uh, local uh, languages next time. Antonio Ingles, climate challenge, language usage, technical terms and vocabularies, contextualizing its messages, appropriation of cultural differences, enabling the madla people to action. Thank you for your critique. It is well taken and we should have done it and simplified na hindi yung uh, policies na hindi maintindihan in simple language. Lon Maglipas, even a normal Filipino doesn't know what is a planetary doctor. Mm. Okay, so we simplify next time. 
Saint Vin. There's an innovative reusable mask from the OST and someone can collaborate and produce it for public use. Look into that. Dapat ganun, reusable talaga. Seth Pilapil, Omorak City's LCCAP includes health lens thanks to the support of UN Habitat. Okay. And they're building climate resiliency through urban plans and designs. So hindi naman lahat ng LCCAP because earlier it was mentioned that the LCCAPs don't have health. So there's a health aspect in some LC caps of our local governments. Marco, Nico, Baloloy, Go Ate Jess, my cell, Paunli, Go Ate Jess, Dr. Shao uh, Chua, Dear Kong, mabuhay kayo, nako, si Professor Chua, Climate Reality, Felix Alexander Abrugar, watching from Hagone, Bulacan, Beatrice Ann, I don't even use my straws, very good, because my lifestyle doesn't even need it. Ha, ha, ha. Tubig at lagok lang. Okay yan. Vincer Kibral. Kaka-inspire. She's so happy daw. He's so happy and excited to be part of the Climate Reality Project. Beatrice Ann. Eto na. Climate Educate. Ayan, naka-italics lahat. Okay, very good. Amelia De Gia. Go, John. Go, Pandan. Go, Pandan. Okay. Seth Pilapil, John Carl Alonsagay. Very good. 70 initiatives in 12 countries since June of 2016. Thank you, John. And make it more than 12 countries. And in fact, make it the 18 municipalities of Antique. If you can influence 12 countries, make it the 34 barangays of Pandan. Make it the 500 barangays of Antique and the 550,000 Kasimanwas. Local climate action. Do I hear a yes from Carl, from JC? Yes, of course, ma'am. Very good, okay. John, so maganda yung nagsimula ka sa 12 countries, tapos sasabihin mo, mag-meeting ka sa lahat ng barangay, limandaan. Ito nagawa ng ibang bansa. Bakit hindi kayang gawin sa ating hometown? John Paul Gomez, good morning, Inday Lauren, good morning. Mayad ng aga. Sashing, great work, John Carl, Climate Educate Project. Beatrice Ann. Ha, ha, ha. Walang plastikan. Catchy. Ah, maganda yun. Oh. Walang plastikan. Oh, maganda yun. So, Antique, Mandaluyong, Sultan Kudarat, Quezon City, Quezon Province, Cebu, Cavite, Benguet, Leyte, Bulacan. Viewers, hello. Hi, Miss Hillary. Can you share the recipes? Pwede, Hillary, ha? Huh? Um... We will post it after this. Uh, Meron ka art card on your recipes. Yes, uh, I have post that it ready. after I'll this. Ready. After I say goodbye, Sherry, ha, mag post na ninyo. Gusto ko rin malaman. At um, ilalagay natin sa Facebook page ko. Pwede mo lagay sa Instagram mo at saka sa Instagram ko sabihin ko galing sa'yo. Shout out to our mentor, Miss Jessica. Proud menti here. Sashing. That's your real name, Sashing. Can we also integrate in PPAs of LGU's traditional knowledge, yes, of course, proved to be effective in sustainable resource management in the coastal areas. It seems that BIFAR depends so much on science while relegating sidelines of TKPs that contribute a lot to sustainable coastal resources. Yes, traditional knowledge, of course, I've always been an advocate of indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge. Mas alam ng ating mga mangingisda at magsasaka, ah, pang ulap ay ganito na. Ganito ang kulay ng ulap, may mangyayari. Ang hangin, parating na, di ba? Ang, ang mga waves, agan yan, hindi ba? Oo. So traditional knowledge should be used. Asa Shing. Asa Sha Joso. Yes! You were with us for Antique Cuisine. Very good. <clears throat> Maripas Felicio Magno. Salamat sa inyong initiative. Sana lahat makatulong sa pag-save ng Mother Earth. Aha. Uh -huh. Um... Uh, did I read Kyle Aboy? Uh, yes, Jessica. Let me see. And um, okay. And of course, I'm damning text ni Mother Earth Foundation mismo ni Sonia Mendoza. Babasahin ko ang iba. Okay. National Cleanup Day should not be clean up. A brand audit should also be conducted to point out which manufacturers are the real plastic polluters in the ocean. Ayan. Ang gagaling daw na mga climate reality youth. Please author na and pass the national SUP law. Yes. Na-author ko na yun eh. <laughs> Reusals, reusables are safe to use in the pandemic. Tama. And there's a statement signed by 125 scientists 
on reusables. Yes, so veer away from single-use plastic. We should reuse, adaptive reuse, recycle, reuse. Ha, huh, tama na ang lecture, okay? It's lunchtime and I wish I could try the recipes of um, plant-based nutrition diet of Hillary. So thank you very much. Um, Ethan, if you're still with us, it's 12.30 a.m. where you are in the U.S. Keep safe. Your COVID is still rising, just like my country, but it will be good. Nashreen, uh, Climate Reality Philippines, and all our leaders, um, the way forward, Nashreen, I've told you about that. And I hope that we could really operationalize all the policies, all the advocacies into the simplest, doable, local climate action. Thank you very much. As we say in Antique, duro, duro gin ka salamat, palangga ko kamo. Thank you very much. We'll see you again. And please post it in your YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, whichever page online and promote it, not for ourselves, so that they can learn from everything that we've discussed in this two hours and 35 minutes of learnings, sharing, and wisdom. Thank you. God bless. Isang luntiang Pilipinas sa ating lahat.